I think that that when we read Revelation 17 and 18, and we get all this Babylon stuff, you know, we get all the nations, the many waters, the, the spiritual adultery, blah, 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 the great whore, and all this stuff. Again, that looks just weird. It looks abstract. It looks like none of these things have any relationship to each other at all, but they all do because there are ways of describing allegiance to other gods instead of Yahweh. There are ways of describing the Deuteronomy 32 rebellion, all this stuff. I want you to be thinking the rest of the time how Psalm 82 links the judgment of the gods over the nations with not only these themes, but also the whole theme of injustice, you know, social, economic injustice, just the, the chaos that the gods sow in the nations. Remember Psalm 82, where what, what, are the, what is God so angry at the gods for? Now, he has, he has allotted the gods to the other nations. He has abandoned the nations because he's judging them for the, the whole Tower of Babel episode. He's fragmented them through the languages. The, you know, we all know the Tower of Babel story, okay? What we miss is the allotment of the gods to the nations and the nations to these other gods. If you've read Unseen Realm, this is old hat by now. Deuteronomy 4, 19 through 20. Deuteronomy 17, 1 through 3. Deuteronomy 29, 23 through 26. You get this allotment language of the host of heaven. The host of heaven are called Elohim in these passages. They are called gods, and these gods have been allotted to the nations. God has taken Israel. This is the language of Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20. He has taken Israel to be his own, and he has abandoned, he has judged the other ones. You get to Deuteronomy 32, when the Most High divides up the nations, he divides them up according to the number of the sons of God. Israel is Yahweh's own portion. And, and again, it's a judgment. And so what, what, what happens next in the biblical story is that God says, okay, we're done now. You, you, know, you, you don't get to set up your own religious system where you build a ziggurat, it's part of a temple complex, and then I come to you and say, what do you want? Okay, we're not, you're doing exactly the opposite I told you to do. I, I, we repeated the Edenic mandate, you're supposed to disperse all over the earth and, and reclaim it for me. We're, we're, we're here to try to kickstart Eden again, folks, and you don't seem to get it. Fine. Let's see if you get this. I'm out of here. I am no longer having a relationship with you. I'm going to allot you to these lesser members of the heavenly host. And, that, and then next, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go call this dude Abram, Abraham, and his wife, and I'm going to raise up through them a new Adam, a new humanity, a new people for me, because that, that's why I started Eden. I want a human family. You don't seem willing. So, so long. Okay, now we're going to start it again. We're going to do it again. And, and Abraham and Sarah are perfect because she cannot have children. This is wonderful because when I enable her to have a child, no one on the face of the earth is going to be able to deny that the only reason this people exists, Israel, is because of a supernatural act on my behalf. I get the credit. Okay, I'm the creator. Nobody else is. And so this is what God does. Now, when he, when he does it, he makes Abram a promise in Genesis 12, chapter right after Babel, and says, now look, it's going to be, you know, I'm going to promise you all sorts of things. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to multiply you. You're going to be like the stars. And, you know, and we've had, you know, David Burnett on in the past talking about the star language. It's not just quantity. It refers to a quality that, that this is the people who are going to be, are going to be with me in a new Eden. You know, it's it's the language of glorification. It's not just quantity, but quality. But you know what? Those nations that I just divorced, we're not forgetting them. Because one day, just like I told Eve that one day she's going to have a, a human child, there's going to be a human being that extends from her lineage who will be born, who will undo the effects of this disaster that happened in the Garden of Eden. So just like I told her that, I'm going to tell you something. One of your seed is going to be the key, going to be the conduit through which all of these other nations are going to be brought back into the family. I will have my people from them. Okay, I'm not going to you know, abandon them permanently. They're on the shelf now, but I'm going to use you to bring them back, to bring, bring the nations back. 
And this is this is the Old Testament you know, story. Now, what happens is that the gods who are appointed over these other nations, and, and since God is still interested in them, I mean, if you're a member of some other nation in Old Testament times, there's no rule against you joining Israel, except for one. You must abandon other gods. You must turn your back on all other gods. You must confess that Yahweh is the God of all gods and that he has entered into a covenant relationship with these people known as Israel. And, I, and, when, and when I join them, I will worship no other. I will, I will trust no other. I will, I will presume that no other deity will you know, rescue me from Sheol. I will presume that he is the God of all gods and that only he is capable of rescuing me from death, ultimately. This is what you must believe, and there's no rule against anybody believing it. We, we know that there are pagans and Gentiles in the Old Testament who come over, they switch sides. There's no, there's no barrier to that other than turning their backs on their gods. So, you know, this is what's going on. Well, the, the, the gods of the nations, their strategy becomes, okay, well, we'll just, we'll just seduce Yahweh's people into abandoning him. We're going to turn them into idolaters. And the people in, in our, under our charge, we're going to enslave them. We're going to make them dependent on us. We're going to sow so much chaos in their lives. We're going to sow so much fear in their lives that they're, they're going to be so paralyzed with fear that they wouldn't think of leaving us because we'll retaliate, we'll destroy them. You know, we're, we're, it's a fear-based, power-based, abuse-based, chaos-based system. And if you read Psalm 82, this is what you get in verses 2 through 5. This is what they're doing, and this is why God is angry. So I want you to be thinking about all that as a background, because when you, when you head in, into the rest of Revelation 17 and 18, there are a number of places where it describes the economic you know, in, in, injustice. And what I mean by that is, is ways that those who hold power enslave people economically through what they can eat, through what they own or what they don't own. They create economic dependence on this. You know, you go to Revelation 17, 1 through 2, you know, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. With the kings of the earth, they have committed sexual immorality. Okay, so they, they, they hold the power brokers in, in their hands, okay? You get to Revelation 18, 2, and 3. That's Revelation 17. Here's Revelation 18, 2, and 3. Let's just go to verse 1. Then I, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority of the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth. They're the, they're now all of a sudden we throw in the merchants, and the, the, the people who will use wealth to victimize and enslave others, okay? The merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So there we add the economic element. You keep reading in, uh, in chapter 18, you get to verse 5, and you know, we see it again. For her sins, Babylon's sins, are heaped up in God for her iniquity. Her body herself and back others. Repay her deeds, mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her like a measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I, have, I am no widow. The mourning sh I shall never see, you know, M-O-U-R. You know, she, she's not going to see disaster. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. You, know, you go down a little bit further, you get verses 10 through 17. Look at, look at how Babylon is described. Alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants, there they are again, of the earth, weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, 
purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood. I mean, there's just a long grocery list of spices. I mean, this is the economic center because Babylon was the dominant world empire. Okay, let, let me just be real simple. You know, it's like Thomas Jefferson said. Okay, the, the, the more that the government gives you, the more it can take away. Okay, when, when you are under its authority, when you are dependent on it, it will strangle you. It, it, you have now given it the power to crush you and to control you and manipulate you. This is what, you know, it, you know we live in America, but we're still fond of, 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 of saying you know, things like, and, and it's true. When is the last time government surrendered power? It doesn't. And this is why economic power and other kinds of manipulative power are used in the Bible both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and here in Revelation. Revelation picks up all these themes. I'm reading the book of Revelation, I'm reading Revelation 18. So this is why these things are, are referenced, because when a system, when a system of power owns you, you're trapped. Okay, You're, you're going to suffer greatly to ever get out from under it. It will not allow it. It will not tolerate you excusing yourself from the arrangement. It owns you. And it's an abuse of power. It's an opportunity for chaos. It's an opportunity to exploit and destroy. And this is why the book of Revelation casts Babel in these economic terms. And that goes right back to Psalm 82. It goes right back there. This is the kind of abuse of people that God does not want. God is not in favor of coercive, abusive power exercised by people over other people. And he's not in favor of, of it because ultimately, when it is evil and coercive and abusive, ultimately, the ones driving the bus aren't necessarily the human power brokers because behind the human power brokers, there's a more sinister intelligence that wants to destroy, that wants to enslave, that wants you to worship them. This is, again, this is why the, the, the nations, both in, the, in Psalm 82, Revelation, and lots of other passages, I mean, there's tons of passages like this in the Old Testament. This is why the nations are described this way and why the gods of those nations get looped into it. It's all one huge chaotic evil system that is aligned against, ultimately, the people of God. So, you know, why, again, let's go back to the why question. Here's, this is what I think it's, it's really about, because where is all this leading? Chapters 15, 16, 17, 18. Well, 19, you know, we're, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get Armageddon. We're going to get the return of the Lord. We're going to get, we're going to get the day of the Lord, you know, enacted. We're going to get all this evil. We're going to get the beast dealt with. Now think of it this way. If this is really about God against the nations, if, if this is really about the Psalm 82 judgment of the gods, the death of the gods finally coming to pass, think about the purpose of that. Think about the purpose of that. Revelation 17 is an integral part of the day of the Lord judgment of the gods and the reclaiming of the earth. Why? For the re-inheritance of the Messiah. The earth is going to be wiped clean of chaos. The earth is being readied again to be sacred space for the true God and the king. That is ultimately what this is about. The earth must be made fit. Okay? It must be made fit for the reoccupation of the true king in a new Eden with his own family and his reconstituted council going back to Eden. And that's us. So again, we, we, need, to, we need to pay attention to the, to the theological backdrop behind all of these sorts of descriptions. It's not about who has the best weaponry. It's not about you know, who has the best army. You know, it, it, it's, it's ultimately about the gods getting what they deserve, 
the beast getting what it deserves. It, it's about the annihilation of chaos. Chaos must be annihilated. It must be eliminated in, in, in totality. Because this time when the Lord returns, chapter 19, okay, he's going to be occupying a new Eden. And in this case, the new Eden is global. The whole world, every nation, every square inch of the place has to be readied and retooled, refit to be sacred space because he is showing up. Okay, he is reoccupying. So again, we, we need to think a little bit bigger picture about these these things. I know they they look strange, they look disparate, they look like they're not related. They're all related. They all fit together. Uh, again, in, if you can if you can take the bird's eye view and look down and look where where John is 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 drawing all this stuff. And the key here is is the Babylon. The key here is the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And then the imagery makes sense, and the end game makes sense. The ultimate conflict, as it as it is being as the the players are taking sides, they make sense. 